Thank you for tuning in to a sermon from Redemption Hill Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. It's our prayer that this will lift your heart and encourage you, set your eyes more fully on Jesus as we open God's word together. You can join us anytime in person or online in our live stream. You can find that at redemptionhilldc.org. If you're not in D.C., we encourage you to get involved in a local church where you live for the sake of encouragement and accountability in a local body, but we're also glad to have you join us and, and walk through this study with us. If you'd like to support the Ministries of Redemption Hill, you can do so at our website, again, redemptionhilldc.org. And Father, thank you that we are, have the, the chance to be together today. Thank you for the way that you're in, at work in our own lives every day in ways that we don't recognize and see as you provide for us and in our world around us and in our church as we gather together and, and want to seek your voice and your leading and your will for us. In the time we spend this morning in your word, I pray that you would shape us through it. That in, in, as we come toward the home stretch in our study in Ecclesiastes, that you, would, that you will have used this series to give us a realistic perspective on life and reality but in all of that, that you'll point our hearts to Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in Ecclesiastes today, so we're jumping right back into where we had left off. We're at, it really essentially chapters 10 and into chapter 11 today. We have a longer section today. Um, this is a book written by a person that's identified as, in the ESV, it translates it, The Preacher. His name, or his title is Koheleth in the Hebrew, and so it's a little bit undefined, but we know that it's somebody who was a king and wealthy and in Jerusalem, so somebody like Solomon, if not Solomon himself. As we've gone through Ecclesiastes, there have been different sections that we've walked through that have different emphasis points, but we never got far away from where it started, where the opening section of Ecclesiastes begins by saying, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And so it's been a positive series since then. <laughs> um, but as we've walked through, we've also talked about that that word vanity doesn't mean like sitting in front of a mirror being a sense of pride or, or perspective on yourself. The vanity that's being talked about is that life is like a vapor, a mist, that it's fleeting, that it's here and it's gone, that there's nothing to grasp onto. And so along the way, we've seen all kinds of different pursuits and angles to give us the fullness of wisdom that can be attained under the sun. And so this is the, the greatest uh, collection of human knowledge and experience. And in that, we haven't had a lot of Proverbs, which Solomon is known for, but today's section, we do have a number of them. So we're gonna walk through them. That's why it's a longer section. Wisdom literature is, is interesting in scripture. It can be difficult at times because, and we've talked about this, that if you take any individual proverb and study it too hard, you can actually lose the sense of the proverb. And so in, in Proverbs, I think it's chapter 26, there's one verse that says, answer a fool according to his folly, or he'll be wise in his own eyes. And then the very next verse is, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you'll become like him yourself. And so if you took one of those, you would end up losing the, the sense of what is, what is actually being communicated. And so Proverbs are like snapshots, little truths into life that it takes wisdom to apply. And today, that's what we come to, is a series of Proverbs, snapshots of wisdom. And it can be helpful for us. Helpful especially because we live in a world that the flow of information and communication and news and views that people have is constant and fast. We live in Proverbs that talks about the noisiness of the marketplace and listening for the, for the voice of wisdom in the marketplace. And that has gotten harder as the world has become louder. Decentralized communication makes us, is, has some real positives to it, but it also makes us realize that information is less controllable. We're in an election year, and we know that there are, that there are misinformation campaigns happening, even from foreign places, into what is happening in this country. And so it's going to get harder and harder and harder to discern what is true and what is not. AI is only going to make reality harder to discern. And tip, even typically credible news sources make terrible errors as they try to keep up with social media. And so we're at a point where, looking around, there's no real authority or accountability or recourse for false information. And so having wisdom 
and seeking truth gets harder and harder. It's not that new, though. I was looking today, and there's a, there's a quote that's famously attributed to Mark Twain, the American satirist and humorist, that, that he said, a lie can make it halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. I was looking for that because I actually am kind of anal about notating things in my own sermon notes so that I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't ever want to plagiarize other people's thought, and so I footnote all of my sermons. And so I was looking up, when did Mark Twain say that? And I actually stumbled instead on a New York Times article from several years ago that he didn't. <laughs> um, and so, what greater irony is than that, right? Like, the, this quote about lies making it around the world before the truth puts on its shoes actually is a lie. And, um, and it goes back, it was like this whole long article that it was, I'm very long, listing the different people that it may have morphed from. And it goes back, the earliest account of something close to it was Jonathan Swift, who came centuries before Mark Twain. It came through, probably the, actually the closest version to this isn't what, wasn't what Mark Twain said, but it's actually what Charles Spurgeon, the Victorian era preacher said, and he quoted it down to this point. And so I, I need to be good in giving Spurgeon credit when I thought it was Mark Twain, but even he took it from other people. And so, human wisdom, a lie can make it halfway around the world before the truth puts on its shoes. It stands true as a proverb, even if we don't know who said it. But we see right now that greater accessibility to knowledge actually limits the wisdom we have. I thought it would be fun, too, to ask Siri, how do we find wisdom? And Siri said, hmm, let me think about that. Here is a web search for how do we find wisdom. And so we do have the greatest collection of human knowledge that has ever existed in what we can find and access online. That we can access, we have an embarrassment of information and resources that we can look into. And it shows us that information itself, knowledge itself, doesn't bring wisdom. So what we have today is wisdom in an uncertain world. And so this is what we read, Ecclesiastes. I'm actually going to start in the last verse of chapter 9 and read into chapter 11. And this is what we see. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but the fool's heart to the left even when a fool, the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he's a fool. If, anger, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There's an evil that I've seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I've seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there's no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. The fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? The, fool, the toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom, curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell of the matter. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. Even if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. <laughs> he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. 
As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a, of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and at evening, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that is to come is vanity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there was a collection of Proverbs. <laughs> how do we make sense of this today? I'm, what I'm hoping is that, as we, that we can walk through this and see how they're grouped together, gain some practical wisdom, but then really get to the core of what Koheleth is telling us in, in this section. That there is wisdom here that you can see practical wisdom for life. Like, you know, you're better off to sharpen your axe before you go at a tree than to work hard with a dull axe. Those are things that are practical wisdom for work. But, but there's some, there are threads here that hold things together from start to finish and really kind of bracket this whole section. And wisdom is important to us. If you're a Christian, then Jesus talks about this. In Matthew chapter 10, he says, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. He's saying to his own disciples that those who follow him are going into a world that if, that if they're naive, they're going to be eaten alive. And so to be wise, to be discerning, to look at the realities of life, but not to sin. And so he says there's a time when Jesus will make all things new and restores all things to be right, but, but the gospel is not escapist. Jesus says, okay, you're going, to be, you're going to walk through some things that are going to be hard now. Life is going to be difficult. Wicked people are going to try to come and attack you. And, and yet, be wise and also be blameless. So today as we look at Ecclesiastes, that's what I hope, is that we can have practical wisdom that will help us to be wise. So it begins by saying in the first section, and the, there are really th uh, five sections, I think, six sections, that this, six sections that this breaks down into. And so we see wisdom in knowing how life works with wisdom and folly, and wisdom for work, wisdom for how we speak, wisdom for how we lead, invest, and then because it's Ecclesiastes, we come back to all is vanity. That's where our chapter, where our passage ends. But it begins by saying, a little folly has a big impact. And so he's saying, okay, the wisdom is better than the weapons of war. And coming out of this, he was just in chapter 9, Koheleth is telling us, he says, listen, this is the reality of life, is the race isn't to the swift, the victory isn't to the strong, bread isn't to the wise, like this world is upside down, and it doesn't seem like you can actually get ahead, but there, there's still value for wisdom, even if you're forgotten. And so he tells this story, a parable, about a poor man who had wisdom that a great king came against a small city and put it under siege, but the wisdom of this poor man delivered the city. But nobody remembered that poor man. But he, but, so Kohel says, that is so frustrating and maddening to us that, that people who are wise and people who do accomplish much actually aren't recognized for it so often. But he says, still, wisdom is better than might. The poor man's wisdom is despised and his words aren't heard. The words of the wise are, are quiet, but they're better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. And so that's where he comes out of and now saying, wisdom is still better. It, to have wisdom is better than just to always be on the offensive and attacking and, and angry, but one sinner will destroy much good. He's saying it only takes a little bit, a little bit of foolishness to have a big impact. And we know that that is true. We see this in people's lives all the time, especially in an era where, where one mistake can make it so that, that your reputation has, changes forever. That, the, that social media can erupt on one bit of news and it changes people's perspective on an individual that's almost irrevocable. And so we know that this is true. The dead flies in the ointment give off a stench. It's something that, these, that people would have understood, that, that if the flies get in, that it doesn't matter how nice the perfume is because you're going to have dead, rotting flies within it. He says, we can't always tell one way for the other, but, but a fool is going to show himself for what he is. And I know some of you would like to make verse 2 a political statement when it says a wise man, man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's to the left. But that is not what he has in mind. <laughs> What he's saying is, 
Wisdom and folly will be shown along the way in your life's journey. And so what is the practical advice? Verse four, calm down. Calmness will lay, lay great offenses to rest. Calm down. This is like where we can learn from the British, right? This is why I wish Ali was here today. <laughs> we can, you know, keep calm, carry on. Don't be shocked by the reality of this world and the impact of sin. We should never be surprised when somebody acts sinfully if you believe biblical theology that says we all are sinners by nature and by choice. It should never surprise us when somebody messes up. And yet, when somebody messes up, so often our reaction is, what in the world? How could this possibly be so? Well, it should never surprise us to see the impact and the impact that a little bit of foolishness, a little bit of wrong, a little bit of wickedness, a little bit of evil can do. You put that in high places in, among rulers, then then it gets even worse. The impact is even greater. And so you get to this, you know, his, his, his like despair here of saying, why is this? Why do fools get put in high places? Why does life and society seem so backward? And why are the wise and, and even those who are wealthy kept so low? And he has no answer for these. He's raising difficult questions, but this sense of despair has been building all the way through Ecclesiastes with his perspective of this life under the sun. And these are things that right now, again, this is, these are human conditions. Because right now, we can say the same things. We can look around us at the world around us and say, how is it that, that the wickedness of a few has such a massive impact on this world? How is it that... Nobody is happy right now with what's going on and our, what our options are going to be this November. When we look at things and say, how is it that we get into this situation? And, and, and so we can relate to, and this is the value of Ecclesiastes, is it is a real look, a gritty look at the reality of human existence in life. And everything that feels so new and novel to us, everything that seems so fearful and scary is not new at all. There's nothing new under the sun. And it all comes back around in time. And so a little folly has big impact. Um, I, was, when I was thinking about this this week. This is like, um, I, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out a way to pull this off with like a whole church gathered. But I can remember in our youth ministry days, this was the classic move to be like, bake a fresh batch of chocolate chip cookies and give them out to all the kids. As they, and as they were eating them, as you were teaching, I can remember teaching this passage and saying, all right, but well, before you continue to eat those cookies, there was just a little bit of dog poop mixed into the batter. Like visceral reactions. <laughs> and, and it get, but it gets to the point here in ways that I, I couldn't figure out a way to make happen. I wasn't going to bake you know, a couple hundred cookies today and then pull that on you. But, but it gets to the point. Just a little bit can mess up the whole batch. It doesn't take much. So that's reality in this world. The second section that he gets into ta- tells us wisdom at work. And so these are, I mean, these are funny things, right? These are, there's irony in what he's saying. I heard some of you chuckling a little bit. I think some of you are uncomfortable because you don't think you're supposed to laugh when the Bible's being read, um, which is okay. But I mean, think, he, if you, if this is like Murphy, we would call this Murphy's Law. All right, if your work is to dig a pit, you're going to fall into it. If you're, if you're breaking through a wall, uh, a serpent's going to be in there. It's going to bite you. He's like, this is life. It's like, I don't know if you ever saw the SNL sketch Debbie Downer. That's what this is. All right, if your work is to quarry stones, you're going to get hurt by them. If you split logs, you're in danger from the logs. If you have an axe that's blunt and you don't sharpen the edge, you have to use more strength, but wisdom will help you succeed. And, and hey, if, if you're a snake charmer, then it's not real good for you if you get, if you get bit before the snake is charmed. But this is wisdom for work, and, and it, there is truth that we spend most of our lives at work, and there are risks in whatever we do, and so it is one of the great ironies of life, is that the things that we do to be able to provide livelihood for ourselves are also the things that put us at great risk in our lives. Now, for most of us, that's a little bit hard to realize right now. I think in D.C., that's that many of us, many of you, um, aren't quarrying stone. <laughs> and so you're like, well, how am I going to get hurt at work? Have you seen any of the research or have you experienced in your life the impact it has on you physically to sit at a desk all day? Like, it, it will start breaking you down physically. 
And so even if your job is to sit at a desk all day, online, returning emails, or in spreadsheets, you're going to have physical impact even from that. You'll have back problems from an activity as soon as you get past the age 30. <laughs> so we need to work with wisdom. We, and um, we could, there's a whole theology of work within Scripture that, that um, we can spend a lot of time on, but work is such an important issue, and there, may be, there are a few places on earth that are as work and vocation obsessed as this place. Like, work is life here. And it's easy for work to shape us and be our greatest joys and our greatest sorrows, the thing that, that, that shapes us throughout the week that is most consuming for us. Don Carson, the theologian, has observed that Americans work at play, play at worship, and worship work. And that may be true nowhere more than it is true here. Because we do. There are more recreational leagues and trivia nights and ways to distract yourself in D.C., in the D.C. metro area, than anywhere else. There, and, and so we do. We work at play, which it doesn't make it restful. We play at worship, so spiritual life is what gets sidelined. I'll make it there if I can, but only after I work and after I rest the way I want to. And work is what we lay our lives down for. That's not the biblical perspective. That we, the, the biblical perspective of work is that we're joining God in his good work. Any time that we're bringing order from chaos, we're joining God in, in providing and protecting and forming and filling and cultivating this world. And so it glorifies God. And, it's, and for us to be successful, we need to be wise in our work. But part of being wise in our work is not letting our work consume us. There is a reality of diminishing returns in the amount of hours that you put in. Sometimes you do have to step back and sharpen the ax. He moves on then to wisdom and how we speak from verses 12 to 15 and, and talking about words that come out of our mouths, saying the words of a wise man win him favor, but the lips of fools consume him. The beginning of, words, of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies his words, though no one, can, no one knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? And the toil of a fool wearies him, for he doesn't know the way to the city. So basically, he's saying a fool here is somebody who, whose words expose him for what he is, who keeps talking and uses a lot of words to get there, and starts off what might seem foolish, but ends in what is madness. And he doesn't know what he's talking about, and a fool will never stop and ask for directions. So gentlemen, there's a lesson here for every one of us. But he thinks, speak wisely. Again, these are things that have been echoed through the ages. Abraham Lincoln said, it's better to remain silent than be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. And Plato said, wise men speak because they have something to say, but fools because they have, because they have to say something. So there's wisdom to say, at some points, you just have to stop talking. A fool start, talks and uses a lot of words about stuff that he cannot know. And, it, and again, it starts, might start as foolishness. It might seem like, yeah, that's not a big deal. But, he, the, but as you look around, the more it goes on, the more wicked it can become. And so there's importance in the clarity of communication. And remember that Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, that there's nothing that can go into you that makes you unclean. But it's what comes out because it's out of the overflow of your heart that your mouth speaks. We will answer for every word we say, everything we write, every email we send, every tweet we tweet. It reflects who we are. And so there's wisdom needed in communication to speak wisely and clearly, to know when to be quiet and when to speak. Another proverb, right? You've been given two ears and one mouth. Use them proportionally. The fourth area gets into his leadership, that we're to lead wisely. And this is the section that we see, uh, in this section, the vital importance in leadership and in politics. He's saying it's, it's not good for the whole of a place when their leaders are fools. Leaders really do make a difference, whether they're childish or whether they're mature, they're mature and wise. 
Tony Evans says here that the character of a nation's rulers is crucial since its citizens will inevitably be blessed or suffer as a result of their leadership. And so interacting with leaders, it says here, is demanding and can be delightful, but is also dangerous. When he says, you know, if it's demanding, if, if, there, if people ignore the responsibilities they have, it's through sloth that the roof sinks in. So if we're, it's when we're lazy that things will get out of order and break down. And there is joy that comes in this, but it's dangerous because, and, and so here it makes me think about um, back in verse 20, even in your thoughts don't curse the king. Now, this is a section where we hear Solomon's wisdom, even in your thoughts don't curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell of the matter. I think we can hear this and say, well, wait a second, the First Amendment gives me freedom of speech, and this is what it means to be an American. Yes, and there's still wisdom (laughs) in how you speak. This is like Aragorn warning the hobbits that Sauron has his spies. <laughs> and you never know, even the birds will come to him. And so it's saying leaders matter. Treat leaders with reverence and respect. And I know it grates against your nerves and you want to be able to stand up. You want your own version of justice to be served. Yes and amen. And yes, as, if you're a Christian, you ought to um, you have the freedom to go and exercise your civic responsibility in voting your conscience. And, we all, and it's true that we ought to be able to call out injustice and wrong and be able to cite truth and reality. But we've talked about this throughout Ecclesiastes even, that we, if, if you are a Christian, then you have, you have responsibilities in the way that you criticize that you have a responsibility to, to remember that every single person bears the image and likeness of God, even the leaders that you despise. That everyone, because of that, is worthy of a level of dignity and honor because they bear the image and likeness of God. And to, go, to speak against them and condemn them is to condemn somebody that bears the image and likeness of God. Now, does that mean that we never call out truth? No. But it does mean that if you're representing somebody's views, you ought to represent them at least as well as they do or in ways that they would agree with you. It does mean that you'll pray for people and that you can criticize actions and decisions but not cross the line into condemning someone's personhood. And so it's saying don't gossip, don't speak against, don't just speak flippantly. We need to assume full control of whatever information comes to us and out of us. All right, the fifth area then as we get into this is the beginning of chapter 11 and one of the most mysterious sections of scripture. None of us understands these idioms. Um, Idioms are used all the time. I've used a number of them today, just in passing comments. And there's things that we just get embedded in our speech. If you are, if you, if you only know one language, then it's hard to understand because idioms come naturally. It's when you're learning another language and learn there's all kinds of ways to say things that are not going to be in the textbooks. They're going to change regionally. That are just expressions of speech that people use, and and so within that, it's it, then you can actually understand how this is if if you're learning a second language. But here, this is an idiom of the time in Hebrew that we just don't understand. Commentators will say it might be this, but when he says "cast your bread upon the waters and you'll find it after many days," we have no clue what that means. <laughs> but the best take that I've seen is that this is, though they're difficult to understand, the best take I've seen is that these are all pictures of business and investment. It's wisdom with investment and particularly with money. So some have said that this cast your bread on the waters and you will find it after many days might be a portrait of maritime trade and investing in maritime trade, though it will take time to come back to you. Maybe. (laughs) But it does get clearer as you go on. Give a portion to seven or eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. He's saying, have a diverse portfolio. Those of you who have portfolios. (laughs) He's saying, don't just get all your eggs in one basket. There you go, another cultural idiom. But be diverse in the way you invest. And remember, you can't predict storms. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves. And if a tree falls, then where it falls, it will lie. So things are going to happen. You don't know when disaster is going to strike. But also then, don't wait for the perfect conditions. When he says in verse 4, if you observe the wind, you will not sow. And if you regard the clouds, you will not reap. 
So he's saying, you'll never have perfect conditions. They will never come. Derek Kidner, an Old Testament, uh, brilliant Old Testament commentator, says here, few great enterprises have waited for ideal conditions, and neither should we. Our business is to grapple with what is and what is within reach. Or Tony Evans again, if you procrastinate because of circumstances, you won't accomplish anything. Don't ever put God in a box based on your limited perspective and framework of thinking. He'll blow up your box every time. Instead, be industrious even as you trust him. And so this is his advice here. And this goes on to, this wisdom goes on beyond just finances. Because it's true that we don't know when disaster is going to strike in our lives. And if we live in fear of disaster, we'll, we'll actually make poor decisions because of it. And if we wait for perfect conditions, they will never come. That is true across all kinds of areas. That's true about, I mean, for some of you, all right, we're, I'm not just going to go here for a minute. The number of conversations I've had over the last weeks and months with single men and women in this church who are saying, I just need somebody to like ask me to go out and it would be great. I'm hearing it from both of you. And yet, I'm also hearing from both of you, I've asked like four or five, six people out, some in the church, some other Christians I know in the city, and I keep getting turned down. So men, women, your perfect spouse does not exist. I'm not saying settle for somebody you're gonna be angry at for the rest of your life, but I am saying that if you're looking at marriage as a way for your self-fulfillment and completion, you are going to be sorely disappointed by whoever you get. (laughs) <laughs> and so stop waiting for the perfect conditions you're not going to get writing across the sky you're not going to have someone that comes in and says whatever you do I will never criticize you and I will lay myself down for you and I will always stay in shape <laughs> so say yes and go out on a, a date doesn't hurt anybody If you wait for perfect conditions and that is something you want, it's never going to happen. Now, if you're glad to be single, and I know some of you are, then great. Singleness is a gift. And marriage is a gift. And both of them bring their own sanctifying truths. But don't wait for the perfect conditions. This is true for some of you who are trying to figure out when to have kids. There is never a wise time where you go, you know what? We are financially stable enough that this is a good money decision. It is a horrible money decision. Every time, the amount of, if you look into the research of how much a kid costs, it's horrifying. None of us would say, I would like to make that investment that will probably never come back to me. <laughs> so there's never a good time. If you're looking for a time to, to if you're looking ahead at your own life, you're looking, if, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out when to make investments, when to invest in relationships, when to reach out to somebody because you're lonely and you're saying, I just want to have a friend to hang out with, but then you just sit on that and wait for the perfect friend to come along and offer themselves to you, then you're never going to have that friendship. This is what happens in churches that Bonhoeffer warns against the person that has their ideal of community because they're the ones that will destroy community fastest. If you want to have community in your church, then be the one that fosters community and build the community you're looking for. Like, don't wait for everything to line up perfectly for you. Live generously. Live, invest yourself broadly, not just financially. But stop just waiting around. Real life is happening right now, every day. And so make something of it. The worst that can happen is she says no. (laughs) And then you move on and try again and build resilience. (laughs) All right, this comes to our conclusion then. As he ends with, light is sweet and pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if you live many years, rejoice in them. This is the same as the ending of the last section. (laughs) Rejoice in the days of your vain life. But rejoice, if you have many years, rejoice in them, but remember that the days of darkness will be many and all that comes is vanity. He's saying death comes for us all. And after that, under the sun, there's nothing. 
And so with the conclusion of Ecclesi- next week we finish Ecclesiastes. Some of you are like, oh man, this is like, this is my heart language and I could sit here forever. And others of you are like, praise God, it's time to move on. But next week we are finishing it. But as we're heading toward that conclusion, we come back to where we began. The very first verses of Ecclesiastes say, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanities. And, and so here we are again. All is vanity. It's a vapor. It's a mist. It's here and it's gone. And this is the tension we've seen all the way through Ecclesiastes, that the fullness of human wisdom and knowledge, all that you could ever test or try or indulge in or sacrifice in your life, that he's tried it all. And it all comes up empty in the end. Because in the end, your life and my life are here and they're gone. Now, we have heard that 10 out of the last 14 weeks. And still, if we actually think about it, it's still shocking. It still knocks us off kilter a little bit because we are born and created with eternal longings in our hearts. None of us remembers a time when we didn't exist. And we hear about those times, we learn about them, and we trust that something is, that's reported is true, but, but we have longings that are larger than our lives. We have things that we desire that outpace our years on earth. And, and while the days of our lives do go slowly, I can promise you that the years will pick up speed the older you get. And so why live with wisdom? Why invest and lead and speak and work wisely? It's all vanity, and a little bit of folly, a little bit of sin has a big impact. And so why is any of this necessary? You know, every section of Ecclesiastes is ended with eat, drink, enjoy what you have in your vain life, but it's all going to darkness. You see, again, Koheleth is brilliant at seeing the brokenness of this world. He's brilliant at seeing the wickedness of the human heart. He's brilliant at citing and calling out the upside-down nature of life and reality, that the wise gain nothing extra in the end, but he says, but it's still somehow better. The powerful don't win, the wealthy are miserable, because, but because his perspective is limited to what is under the sun, there is still hope that is beyond what he can see, because he can't have much hope. His perspective is limited to be under the sun. There's no greater story. And that's what makes Ecclesiastes the truest of all books. That's a line that's ascribed to Herman Melville, which also is not true. But his main character, Ishmael in Moby Dick, does say, that mortal man hath more, who hath more joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or, under, or undeveloped, with books the same. The truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine-hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. All this willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet. So what Melville says is actually stronger and more powerful. He's saying living in this broken world, we will experience sorrow and frustration. This is the real stuff of life that we try to minimize our whole way through. Every one of us, we we either fall into like stoicism of just I'm going to suck it up and get through this or we go into um, just the opposite of saying like I'm gonna try to minimize all fear and pain and I'm gonna go into living for all of the happiness I can and just anything that's not happy, I'm gonna shove down and then one day I'll die. But that's not true happiness. It's not true joy. If you haven't seen it lately and you wanna get wrecked and weep your way through the afternoon, go watch Inside Out today. But healing only happens when joy lets sadness take control. That's why we need Ecclesiastes. And it's true that a little folly has big impact. One sinner destroys much good. You realize that is literally the storyline of Scripture. So these, these kinds of sermons, I'm gonna, I'll confess to you, church, these are hard for me. I, like, for me, just the way that I'm wired, it's like you want to get into like, the sweeping theological themes of Scripture and seeing all the threads of the gospel throughout. I'm, I'm in, and I get, a, I get fired up. But when it comes to this, it's like, okay, practical wisdom for investments. That doesn't, like, stir my soul um, it's important, and it is important to live wisely. Again, Jesus said, live, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. But 
this is why Ecclesiastes at its core is so important and why wisdom is more important than he gives it credit for. One sinner did destroy much good. In Genesis 3, that is the message, is that God created human beings in his image and likeness. The only thing that wasn't good was, was when man was alone, and so God completed his creation by bringing woman because man or woman on their own can't reflect the fullness of God's image and likeness. We reflect the fullness of the image and likeness of God. And Romans 5, verse 12 tells us, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The storyline of Scripture is that Adam's sin has changed much good. That God created everything good for us to live in perfect existence with each other and with him and with his creation and, and to be in that perfect unity and community for eternity. And one man's sin messed it up. Now, say whatever you want to about Eve. He tried to blame her too. <laughs> but the biblical case is clear. Adam's sin is what got us into this mess. Now, we could debate the nature of sin, and here it does say, like, well, sin came to every one of us, so that's what people call original sin, that we are born into sin, that we are born sinners whether we want it to be or not, and then, but he doesn't leave it there. He says, and all sinned, and so that's volitional sin, or so we are sinners by nature and by choice. Whichever way you want to argue it, we, we have both areas covered. And that's been passed down to us generationally from Adam, but there's hope for us because what we read as it goes on is the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, that's Adam, much more have, have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. You hear this, he's saying that one who is perfect has come. This is our hope, is that, that Adam, through one sin, sin multiplied, but Jesus reversed that, that through one man's righteousness, sin has been rolled back in spite of its multiplication. And he goes on to say, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So this is the hope of the gospel. Koheleth is right. This world is a mess. That's why we need to walk with wisdom, why we need wisdom and not to be a fool who destroys his own life and exposes his folly, why we need to be careful in how we work, why we need wisdom in the ways that we approach leaders and wisdom in the ways that we invest ourselves, time, money, relationally, energy. We need wisdom in all of those things because we live in such a messed up place because he's right, right where he started in saying, one sinner destroys much good. And remember, back in chapter 7, in verse 20, he said, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. That's true. Except in Christ Jesus. And so what do we do with all of that? The biblical claim is that Jesus is the second Adam. That sin and death came through one, life and righteousness has come through the second. That he is the one that if we put our hope in him, we are reshaped and reformed into the image and likeness of God by the work of the Spirit in our lives. Well, what we do with that comes a little bit later in Romans, because it tells us very clearly, what does it mean to give your life to Christ? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does that look like? And it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Now, this is if for those of you who are here that are not Christians, this is what it means to follow Christ. It means to believe with all that you are in the facts of the gospel, but to come to a point where you can accept God's grace for you, where you can finally say, you know what, I can't earn this on my own, and the, entireness, the entirety of human wisdom under the sun lands me where Koheleth is to say, all right, I'm going to enjoy the days that I've got now, but darkness is coming, and those will be many more days than the light. And who knows what comes after? There's hope for us. Turn to Christ as your Lord, and then that is, that is the wisest thing you can do. You see, this is the wisest thing in the world, is to see, see this world for everything it is, to, to feel all of the weight and sadness and despair of it. Ecclesiastes is the fine hammered steel of woe. Because if we come to the end of ourselves, we will finally come to a point where we can look to God to provide us hope that we can't earn on our own. And that is unique to Christianity. In all of the world's faiths and religions is that Christianity is not human pursuit of God to do enough to come to him. It is God reaching to us, taking on flesh, and making a way for our salvation. So listen, if you've turned to Christ then the wisdom of God is in the, is, comes in Christ, and what the world sees as foolish. Christ is the power of God, and what the world sees as weakness. Life has come through death. Righteousness has come through another person's work. None of that makes sense in the world that we live in, and it is the truth of what God has brought for us. And if you have turned to Jesus, he becomes the singular shaping reality of your life. That's when the wisdom of this world takes on more purpose because your eyes are set on a greater reality. There is a truer hope and an eternal impact. And if you're a Christian, that's more than, this is more than just a matter of living wisely and investing wisely and working wisely and dealing with leaders and politics wisely. And Jesus has called us to be wise as serpents because this world is not comfortable. It's not a friendly place. And it's going to take real wisdom to navigate it and real wisdom not to fall back into wrong patterns. He's also called us to be innocent as doves without sin, pure and holy through him and the Spirit's work within us. And so what we see today in the text is we live in a broken place where one sinner can mess everything up, and so it's going to take wisdom to navigate in our work, in the way we speak, in the way we lead, the way we, ways we invest ourselves. In Christ, these things are all true, but we can rise above to see a greater truth that looks beyond the time when sin destroys, when all things are made new, and live the realities of that new existence here and now. Let's pray. Father, this, we do need wisdom to navigate this world. We need wisdom in our lives. We need wisdom today and this week. Some of us have big decisions this week in these different kinds of areas of decisions that might be coming in work or decisions in, in how we speak and how we relate to people and maybe cleaning up some messes that have been created because of how we've spoken to people. Some of us have decisions in how we're investing ourselves. In our, it could be financial investments and that you need wisdom for. It could be investments of time and energy we need wisdom in all of this, and it's hard to have because this world isn't clear to us because it is a mess. And a little sin messes up much good, but we're in a world that is broken. It's not just a little. I pray today that you would give us the confidence and the courage to trust what you've given us in Christ. To really believe, not just in our minds to be able to assent to it, but to, to come to a place in our hearts of seeing that the longings that we have will never be filled by the things we can gain in this world here and now. But that we have to look to something greater. Would you give us trust that Jesus is the one who can meet us who can reform and reshape our lives and give us new eyes to see reality. 
and give us something transcendent to be connected into as we are working alongside you, Father, in making all things new. So I pray that by your spirit you would move to give hope and courage and an assurance of our salvation today, we pray.